first of all, let me thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some of my ideas about uh, how to make expensive drugs accessible to the masses. And uh, in the context of this COVID-19 um, uh, uh, pandemic, it's also important that uh, the vaccines can be produced uh, uh, sufficiently to meet the needs of the, of the world. So I will also address that particular question. Okay, okay, good. Uh, the well-known problems that are waiting to be overcome are these. Uh, first of all, we have very expensive drugs, uh, but uh, we know that uh, many of them are very effective in uh, helping patients. And uh, um, potentially hundreds of millions of people can benefit from, from, from this. Uh, unfortunately, because they're so expensive, uh, personally, only um, uh, uh, very few patients uh, can benefit from, from these drugs. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, first of all, they need an adequate return to offset the R&D cost uh, and, uh, and to obtain a reasonable profit. Um, the, the problem with this is that uh, uh, if the uh, drug companies reduce the prices dramatically, potentially, you can increase uh, use. But uh, because the demand is so inelastic, then you need to uh, drop the prices so much that the significant decrease in uh, price is not sufficient offset by the increase in demand uh, uh, prompted you know, by that uh, drop in prices. Uh, econ economists call this inelastic demand. And in, in this case, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies will not have the incentive to drop the prices. So we, we are pretty much stuck. So, um, and in, in the context of this COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the problem is that production capacity may not meet the needs. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, we have a very tight time frame. We need to produce sufficiently amount of uh, vaccines to, to meet the, today's needs. And uh, we can't wait, so, so we, uh, the, the question is how to increase this uh, production capacity. Um, uh, but uh, if you uh, re rely on the pharmaceutical pharm companies to produce in-house, it's very difficult to, to, to meet those needs. So uh, I, yes, uh, so the, uh, the, the main idea that I have uh, uh, um, conceived over the last year is that uh, uh, it is possible to uh, um, um, repay sort of the intellectual property right, uh, return to intellectual property right uh, in an uh, innovative uh, way and uh, to make the uh, mass production of generics legal but the inventor will receive an IPR fee, okay, from a global insurer. So the idea is uh, have an innovative kind of uh, insurance system so that you have a global insurer which will collect insurance premiums from participating countries. And uh, uh, the drug company will collect this IPR fee uh, based on the volume of authenticated administrations of the drugs. So as long as we, we have uh, uh, trust that uh, this particular prescription has been made by an, uh, by an, an uh, authorized uh, physician and has been uh, used to an um, authenticated patient, so you know the volume, and then you can pay the drug company uh, according to the volume, okay, so the drug company uh, can uh, receive uh, the return uh, to the IPR. Um, but meanwhile, patients pay a small, small fee. So 
uh, small, uh, a low price you know, for the drug. So the direct user price is, is much, much lower. Right? And that's what counts. If the direct price is high, then the demand will be uh, dramatically reduced. So, so it wouldn't work. So you have to let users pay very low price. Okay? But on the other hand, the drug companies the, they, uh, uh, will receive uh, compensation uh, in some other way. So uh, from this global insurer, which I uh, am proposing. So, uh, and uh, to, add, to add attract uh, attraction, the IPR fees per dosage can be collected indefinitely, okay? Uh, although it may decline for some time, uh, after some time. Uh, today, we know that uh, most patents uh, will uh, expire in 20 years, okay? So after 20 years, it's all finished, okay? And of course, the, the drug companies will try to extend it by all kinds of means, like uh, doing some kind of change you know, to the original formula, and uh, 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 in order to make extensions. But uh, uh, my idea is that uh, if you can use this concept, okay, then say after 20 years, uh, the drug companies can continue to, to receive the, the IPR fee, okay? But at, uh, it will uh, gradually decline, so it will gradually vanish, okay? But it will be extended for a much longer time, and so the drug companies will have a great incentive to, to join the system. Uh, so insurance uh, premiums are paid by the governments based on population. So if you have a big population, then more people will potentially benefit and the government will have to pay more. And it will also have to consider uh, demographic composition, per capita income, etc. So in principle, you will have some kind of uh, uh, core subsidy. High income countries will pay higher premiums and low income countries will pay lower premiums. And I think that is uh, uh, just what it should be. Um, and the key cap capabilities required, I'm very delighted uh, that I'm convinced that they are now available, okay, given uh, the contributions from all the uh, parties concerned, uh, uh, including especially those who are participating in this particular conference. So authentication of credentials and compliance, um, there's no question about it, okay? We just heard from, 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 from Stephen uh, that uh, authentication is not a problem, uh, um, um, assurance that there's compliance to the requirements is no, not a problem, and there's no risk of being tempered, and that uh, it's decentralized and yet coordinated, you know, because the, the protocol is, uh, is transparent and applies across the globe. And it's secure and private information is assured, so we have uh, what we call uh, SSI, self sovereign identity, so uh, patients don't need to worry and uh, doctors don't need to worry. Uh, and the insurance agency, you know, that uh, pays this IPR fee do not need to worry, you know, because uh, 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 everything is authenticated. So all this is powered by uh, uh, is, and also already achieved through global efforts such as Trust Over IP, okay, all the uh, members of Trust Over IP Foundation. Uh, the shortfall of the, the current arrangement is that we have expensive drugs uh, that are often not covered in national insurance schemes. And uh, drug companies may not have the capacity for production of sufficient volume to meet herd immunity requirements. And, uh, and then also the fact that uh, after 20 years, there is uh, abrupt termination of patents, okay, and, uh, and that may not be ideal. And uh, um, patents are filed since 1995, typically last for 20 years, as I said, from the date of patent application filing. And sometimes the patent duration may be extended, as I mentioned. Uh, the drug companies uh, um, will try to extend the patent terms for as long as they can. They can make uh, some alterations, uh, this and that, uh, in order to extend those, those uh, drug patents. And uh, in particular, uh, um, all, we also had this uh, Hatch-Waxman Act, 1984, that allows 
patent extensions of five years to make up for how long the FDA approval process is, you know, because the, the patent uh, start counting, you know, the, the term of the patent start counting from the time when uh, the um, application for, for the patent is, is, is filed. And uh, uh, so there is a, uh, usually some, some kind of uh, allowance uh, to make up for that, and, and that was provided by the Hatch Wexman Grant. Uh, 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 Hatch, uh, Hatch, Hatch uh, Waxman Act. It's not. Oh, okay. Now, um, in uh, in Hong Kong, uh, this uh, SMA or spinal muscular atrophy is a big problem. Okay, and uh, 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 we we know the incidence rate is about one in ten thousand births, and. Uh, in Taiwan, I just checked the figure. Um, um, about uh, 25 births per, per year in Taiwan would be diagnosed as having SME. But the problem is not all of those uh, have the potential use, uh, can, can actually use the, uh, the drugs. And uh, um, presently, it is known that uh, four, some 400 patients in Taiwan suffer from SMA. Um, if we applied incidence rate to uh, the uh, 23.5 million population, the number would be much bigger. Um, but uh, um, this one in 10,000 births, okay, that uh, incidence rate uh, cannot directly apply to the entire population. And that is because uh, uh, um, for the entire population, um, we have a lot of uh, much older people, right? But SME type 1 children often die, okay? They're young, so uh, they won't be able to, to survive, okay? Uh, beyond two years, say. So the low survival rate means that the prevalence in population is far lower than the incidence rate at birth. But if you can actually use uh, these uh, 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 drugs, uh, allow more uh, babies to, to enjoy the use of these drugs, then they can live with SMA and actually potentially recover from it, okay? Can survive uh, much, much longer. Okay, globally in um, about 140 million births in 2020 uh, translates to some uh, uh, 14,000 newborn babies around the world having uh, being affected each year. So, so that is a potential number of, of people who can benefit. But uh, uh, personally, uh, those people who actually use is, uh, is less than one third of that. Okay, so, so it's, there's, a uh, there's a multiple, um, um, uh, um, three times, four times, five times, okay, or, um, at least, okay, um, uh, of those people actually uh, using these drugs. And uh, uh, this is a list of uh, uh, drugs. Um, the first three drugs are FDA approved, okay? The Food and Drug Administration approved. The other ones are being tried. And you can see that some of them are exp extremely expensive, but they have proven effective, okay? They have been approved by FDA and they, they are, uh, um, and this is the first drug on, on that list, <laughs> Spinraza. And that's for SMA, and the list price in USA is uh, $125,000 per injection, okay? Which puts the treatment cost at uh, $750,000 in the first year, and then uh, $375,000, and then US dollars, okay? Annually after that, and that, that's extremely expensive, you know? And, uh, and uh, I just estimated, okay? The, the fact that uh, from this particular drug, the company, has an estimated revenue of 2.5 billion, which implies about uh, maybe about 5,000 patients currently use the drug. But we um, we have at least 100, uh, uh, 14,000 uh, um, babies. Okay, uh, will have it uh, ev every year. So uh, uh, the um, the number of patients is uh, three times. Um, the number of people who now use those drugs. Um, 
And then you have uh, some of the extremely uh, expensive drugs like this particular one. It costs uh, $2.1 million per patient. Uh, but uh, for this particular uh, drug, um, just one time use is sufficient. Okay, there's no need for, for further uh, spending, but it's $1.1 uh, $2 million okay, per patient. And that's just uh, um, well beyond what people can afford. So, okay. Okay, so um, now here is a, a, a bit more detail about my proposal. So I'm suggesting that uh, drug developers can license manufacturers uh, to produce a drug or the vaccine for them. Okay, this license is, is important because uh, this ensures drug quality. Okay, this license is strictly for, for drug control, for, for, for quality control. Okay, so um, this license doesn't mean that uh, these manufacturing companies have to pay uh, uh, to the drug company. Okay, may maybe a small fee, but uh, certainly it's not uh, meant, you know, for for them to to to, to get a profit from it. Uh, not not for the, the drug company, the developer of the drug, to get the profits from from these licenses. And then the designated drugs will sell at cost plus a markup. Okay. And uh, if a particular manufacturer somehow can manage the cost better, they can make a, uh, make a bigger uh, profit. So um, these uh, um, are the subscribing countries. That is, country, uh, the, the countries that have uh, bought, uh, bought this insurance, they have subscribed to this uh, global insurance scheme. Then they, the patients will be able to pay uh, a uh, very low price, you know, uh, the generics you know, okay, for these drugs. And then the drug developers will receive an IPR fee according to authenticated vaccination or prescription to real patients, okay, uh, through this system. And I just call it a global organization for drug insurance, okay. And then this um, um, global organization will pay these fees out of country-based insurance premiums collected, okay, from the different countries, okay, uh, from all the subscribing countries, okay. So, uh, again, as I mentioned, um, insurance premiums may vary with population, per capita, uh, uh, income, uh, uh, birth numbers, and other demographic variables. And then the insured com uh, uh, countries or jurisdictions will be allowed to buy from the licensed manufacturers, okay? So they will have access to cheap drugs, generics, okay? But meanwhile, the uh, drug companies that produce those drugs or vaccine will collect IPR fee, okay? According to the volume. So what are the tasks at hand then? Well, first of all, we should select suitable drugs to cover under this uh, particular scheme. Uh, and of course, also vaccines in this particular context. And then uh, we can work out the IPR fee per standard dosage for the, for the drug or for the vaccine. And then we work out the annual insurance premiums to be paid uh, by each subscribing country. So we need to work out the formula. So the formula will, uh, will have to be fair, okay? Something that uh, the countries can, can uh, find agreeable. And then we set up the premium collection mechanism. And we set up the IPR paying mechanism. I, and I propose that there need not be an expiry date, okay, uh, uh, for, the, for the pattern, okay? But I would suggest that, uh, 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 say, after 20 years or so, this uh, um, IPR fee may gradually taper off and become smaller and smaller. Okay, the, the, the idea is that uh, if you extend the term, then the drug companies will be more inclined to, to join, okay, uh, because it's attractive for them, okay. So, uh, so what are the benefits? Uh, I would say that uh, financial access is so important. It can be greatly improved and people in all subscribing countries will feel better protected. And sales will, drop, will jump benefiting 
more people. And um, I think this is a win-win-win situation, okay, because, uh, uh, because the pattern can continue, uh, sort of, you know, the, uh, the income from, the develop, uh, from this drug can continue well after 20 years, even though it uh, becomes smaller. And the drug companies will con con can collect these fees for much, much longer and uh, for more and more people, okay? And um, the, uh, the drug developers will enjoy greater market outreach and will collect returns for a much longer time. And overall returns may be made, uh, can be made to beat what prevails under the status quo. So, so the drug com companies will benefit and then the patients will benefit, okay? And, uh, uh, and also, in this particular case, uh, this COVID-19 case, because with mass production, you know, because you can license many, many manufacturers, so we can produce uh, huge volumes, you know, because it, many companies can be licensed to do it, okay? And it's important to note that because, you're, because these licensed companies are producing uh, um, and uh, they are being made available, then those fake uh, producers, okay, producers of fake products, imitation products, they have very little market, okay, because these drugs are going to be s uh, to sell at much lower price anyway, right? So um, the potential for for, drug, for fake drugs will be much smaller, okay? And the bonus is that collection of big data will help improve assessment of the effectiveness of the drug and also help us understand better the nature and development of different ailments. Um, I think uh, that that's the contribution of my ideas at this time. And I would uh, appreciate uh, receiving any feedback or questions. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, Professor Hall. Thank you very much indeed. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, you know, later on, later on, we are going to have some demo sessions. So uh, to enable us to get ready for that uh, and for, you know, subsequent sharing, let's take a 10 minutes break. Uh, it's around 20 past uh, right now. So let's come back around half past three. Thank you very much. See you later.